I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. The timeline starts in the 1960s with unexplained sightings on and around my childhood home in the northern panhandle of West Virginia. Except for our small family unit, these clues, if you will, are never talked about with relatives. But slowly they added up until it was undeniable that something more is in the mix than raising a family and making a small homestead. Something that shares this dirt road and the surrounding lands. And the first story starts on a warm autumn day in 1967 in a cow field. The field laid behind my parents' homestead that consisted of a small home, several outbuildings, a large garden, and a little over six acres. The neighboring farmer's field met up with my father's land behind his house and was divided off by barbed wire fencing. It was a steep sloping hillside with tall grasses and halfway up the hillside was woods. And it was this hill that my sister, then nine years old, and father saw what they could only describe as monkeys swinging through the treetops with loud chatter. My sister recounts the story as baby orangutans with stringy orangish hair and long arms that swung from branch to branch with swift passage and then out of sight. Their excitement when they entered the house was about the monkey sightings and how did a monkey come to live in West Virginia? Perhaps a traveling circus that lost their monkeys or the well-to-do farmer lawyer that owned the adjoining land had pet monkeys that had escaped. Over the next few days, each explanation slowly seemed unreasonable and even ridiculous until they faded away and then eventually so did the actual sighting. The next unexplainable event took place at my grandparents' home a mile or so down the same road. My grandfather had just passed away, which left my grandmother and aunt in the house alone. It must be said that there's no way to prove this any other than a peeping Tom story, but nonetheless needs to be included in this story since only the neighbors would know of my grandfather's passing and they were relatives. Having said that, on two separate occasions, somewhere around 1967, my grandmother caught a face staring at her through the kitchen window, a feat in itself since the window did not set close to the ground and the only way to even risk a peek inside was standing on top of a slanted coal door. It happened once more, with the local sheriff coming on both accounts sometime later the same night, but found nothing to report. My grandmother moved shortly after that, so we would have no other accounts from this location. Another incident that falls somewhere in between the first sightings and my 15th birthday that I can recall is from the neighbor across the street. One day my father and I were in the yard when the neighbor came over and started to tell about his sighting in the middle of the night. He claimed he saw a bear drinking from the creek that ran between my father's land and the road. My father was kind and listened, but when he recounted it to my mother, even though I was rather young, I could tell that they did not hold much stock in the neighbor's story. My dad hunted for most of the meat on our dinner table and knew the woods well, not to mention had lived on this land long enough to know that a bear had never been reported, ever, let alone a bear in the northern panhandle of West Virginia. This story faded away as well. My father, being a hunter, always had several hunting dogs, mostly coon dogs. He had them chained to a sturdy wooden dog box that sat up on a knoll of sorts in our yard just on this side of the barbed wire fencing that separated the farmer's field from my father's yard. There were many a night that he would have to settle them down because they were bellowing loudly about something they felt was amiss in the neighboring cow field. But once my father fussed at them a bit, they seemed to settle down for the most part. If my dad knew what had the dogs riled up, he never shared it within earshot of me. It just was an uncommon event that he would have to go out and yell at them to settle down on any given night. Until approximately 1976, my 15th birthday had come and gone, and it was now common for me to travel alone to my friends' homes, either on foot or bike, taking the shortcuts through the wooded area that lay around my home. It was a shortcut that landed me at the base of a tall tree with a rope swing tied off at its trunk some ways up the hillside. A great find, to say the least. My friends and I hung out at this swing all summer, and I talked about it at the family dinner table until eventually my brother-in-law asked to see the swing. It was summer, midday, and tucked up in a small hollow off the same dirt road about a mile past my parents' house. We weren't there long, not especially loud either, since there were only two of us. 
and while my brother-in-law started the steep climb up the side of the hill to the tied-off rope, I sat down on a large rock and waited. Over our conversation and laughter, I heard what I can only describe as a woman's scream from behind us up on the ridge. I heard it clearly, he not so much, and when the second scream echoed down the small hollow and reverberated off the surrounding hills, I was now standing and moving toward the path that brought us to the swing, with a firm, I'm out. I was quite sure at this point that a woman had been horribly murdered with the second scream. I never returned to the swing. Years passed, and I left the area. My parents aged, so the hunting slowly waned, and the hunting dogs slowly died off or were sold, and my parents' land grew quieter, with no more reports of unexplained happenings in the hollow. I married and moved with my husband to Ohio for seven years or so, and finally the opportunity came along that allowed us to move back to my hometown and into an old farmhouse that was part of the aforementioned farm with little over four acres of land and with no next-door neighbors. Large open fields with wooded areas surrounded our land, and if we so desired, we could walk from our home through the fields and woods to my childhood home. In other words, it used to be all one big farm, but was divided up through the years. I don't have a timeline of sorts for these next incidents, but I know that they fall between the years of 1992 and 2015, at which such time I sold the family home and moved from the lands. Directly behind the house lay a small wooded area my son and his friend would play in, and on one particular day he came across something that I, as his mother, had no explanation for when he told me about it later while I was cooking dinner. He said that he found two piles of deer parts and such. One pile had the hides and entrails and muscles, and the second had the bones and antlers and such. A bone pile, if you will, not something a mother wants to hear or have to explain. He said the piles were large, as if there were more than one deer. I had him point out the general area to me, and we agreed that he would not play in these woods anymore. The next day, I searched out his findings and never found them. But it shook me, since there isn't any answer that would make such a thing explainable. The family dog at this time was a small beagle poodle mix that tracked like a rabbit dog. On walks, he would spend the time in the fields sniffing out a rabbit or two and chasing them down, so we were used to his barking and such. One night, however, he would go behind the house and run the perimeter of the backyard, barking into the same woods that the deer carcasses were found, but never brave enough to go into the woods any farther. We would call for him for some time, when eventually one of us would have to go out and actually carry him inside. This happened time and time again, with no explanation for his actions. Over the years, we had plenty of accounts of vocalizations, some screams, some loud yells at all times of the night and early morning. Some were close to the house that I would hear through my open summer window, and some we were unsure of how far away they were, since sound carries so easily across the hilltops we were surrounded by. My grown children tell me of several occasions when waiting for the school bus that they started back to the house, which sat at the end of a very long driveway, because of unexplained yells and grunts or movement in the surrounding woods and fields only to be saved by the arrival of the school bus, and my sons have an account of hearing several loud screams through their closed window during winter late one night. I have heard a pack of coyotes yipping along with a yell or two that I couldn't explain that moved me out of bed to close and lock the window. In 2013, my grown nephew moved into a home that was located out at the end of the old tractor road that ran past my house, which made it even more isolated than our home, but shared the same hilltop and adjoining fields. The home had been abandoned for some time, so he spent many long hours in the yard and surrounding fields cleaning up debris. The rental was surrounded by groves of tall pine trees, and my nephew and son tell of a story of hearing a racket in the woods that sounded like something large, elephant size, breaking through the underbrush and branches, then the swaying of a tall pine tree that should not have been so easy to be moved but swayed back and forth furiously, as if with no effort. They have no explanation for what they witnessed. Once in a while, when we were together, we talk about these incidents and the strangeness of them happening throughout the years of us living on this land. And when I add my family's accounts to my childhood accounts, I am quite sure they all tie together. I'm a 34-year-old retired U.S. Army sergeant and combat veteran originally from Connecticut, currently living in northern Italy with my wife. 
My Italian wife thinks this whole subject about Sasquatch is crazy American nonsense, but I think she's saying this because she might be a little intimidated about the subject of Bigfoot being real. I would like to share an encounter that happened in August of 2004 on a camping fishing trip with my friend in the vicinity of Sturbridge, Massachusetts. We were 16 at the time. My friend's mother owned a cottage by a small lake and asked me to accompany them on a trip. Unfortunately, quite a long time has passed, and I cannot recall the name of the lake. I attempted to contact my buddy who was there. Hopefully, I'll hear back from him soon to gather some additional information. On our first day, we set off on a two-man canoe and explored the lake as we fished. We came to the section of the lake bordered by a quiet, lush, green, and dense New England forest. There was a small island roughly 60 feet in diameter just off the shore. We portaged our canoe and began to drink some beer and smoke cigarettes. Being teenagers, we would do anything and everything to not get caught. Never knowing who or what would show up and not wanting to take any chances, we took advantage of the seclusion that part of the lake provided. We finished our beverages and returned to the canoe. A few hours passed as we were enjoying ourselves fishing. We began to make our return and pass by the same island where we were prior. Then suddenly, we heard something running through the woods. A deer leaped out of the woods and jumped directly into the water. It then began swimming toward our direction. My buddy and I thought it was interesting. We had a laugh and both agreed that maybe some type of predator was in pursuit. As the deer swam, it veered toward the island and jumped onto the shore. Frantically, it began pacing around while keeping its eyes fixated on the section of the forest from where it came from. Clearly terrified of something, it proceeded to jump back into the water continuing to the other side of the lake until it finally disappeared from view. After dinner, we decided to do some night fishing. The lake was covered in darkness, and we only brought with us two small flashlights while using the moonlight to assist with visibility. We set off on our canoe and paddled toward the island. About midway, I told my friend that we should do some trolling. I placed two rods in the rear of the canoe and began to paddle. As we were approaching the small island, I kept glancing over to the area where the deer leapt into the lake from the forest earlier that day. I kept having a strange feeling about that area. We began to hear some strange sounds and noises emanating from the dark forest. My buddy said that it was probably a herd of deer and possibly a fisher cat making strange noises. I didn't disagree with what he said. It made enough sense. We stopped trolling as the noises became louder and more alarming. A slow drift brought us roughly 90 feet from the edge of the forest. Out of the darkness, a massive rock impacts the water as if it was a broadside hit from an artillery round. I can still remember the water splashing my face and the canoe rocking from side to side. As soon as the rock hit the water, it was as if my body went into autopilot. Like a robot, I was moving without giving myself any commands. I cut the two fishing lines, we began paddling, and by the time we realized what happened... A great distance was made, retreating back to the safety of the shores of the campsite, creating a small wake in our path from paddling so fervently. We reached the shore of the campsite and looked at each other. I said, what in the F was that? My friend was saying he thought it was a turtle. I needed to remind him, turtles don't fly, dickhead. We remained at the lake for another day and did not have the slightest desire or curiosity to return to the scene. Years have passed and we seldom spoke of it. The few times we did mention what occurred, it was said to a few friends and family. I found it difficult in explaining what happened and the unique type of fear it caused. In order to fully comprehend, one needed to be there or have experienced something similar themselves. As I mentioned prior, I felt my reaction was remarkable. I've been in many intense and nerve-wracking situations, ambushes, firefights, while serving overseas. It was similar to fight or flight without the slightest indication of fighting. My body seemed as if it had a mind of its own. We didn't physically see the creature, however. If we had a strong flashlight and gathered enough of our wits, I believe we could have seen the creature along the woods of the shoreline. In many ways, I'm grateful I did not see it. I'm not sure how anyone, including myself, would be able to process seeing a monster, something that's not supposed to exist. Being an unarmed and hormonal teenager, I'm not sure how I would react in seeing a Sasquatch in front of me. We were very fortunate. I 
I live in West Carolina. The first time I saw something was on a camping trip with my church as a kid. Near Marion, North Carolina, me and four or five boys were sharing a tent. I'm not sure what time it was, but it was past the time we couldn't leave the tent. We were in some campground with a curfew, I assume, but of course we were playing and wrestling. Nobody was ready for sleep. After a while, somebody pointed out a hand touching the tent. We all stopped and looked, but there was nothing to see, so we started playing again. Then Lewis, or at least I think it was Lewis, saw it again, and we all stopped and looked, except for this time I remember being afraid. Not because I saw anything, but Lewis was obviously afraid, so I was too. Then I saw a hand, plain as day, dragging across the tent from back to front. At first I was afraid, but then for some reason, I was sure it was my dad trying to scare us. So I jumped up, unzipped the tent, and ran outside. And walking away was a giant, hairy man. He was walking into the moon, meaning it was in front of me. I just froze. Didn't scream, didn't run, just froze, for I don't know how long, probably just seconds. Then my brain came back, and I started to run back into the tent, and Lewis was standing there frozen. I said, run. That must have woke him up, too, because he did. We jumped back inside and stayed freaked out all night, too afraid to run and tell adults. We were 11 and 12. I'm not exactly sure, but definitely middle school age. He's a pastor now. He messaged me a couple of years ago and asked if I remembered. I remember, all right. Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. If you enjoyed today's video, here's one you don't want to miss. Also, if you have a story you'd like to share on this channel, email me, Lynn Smith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com. I hope to hear from you soon.